Good morning and welcome to panel two on uh, the appropriate level of regulatory oversight. My name is Chris Ansell and I am a political sci uh, professor of political science here at, uh, here at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And um, I think that the panel one did a fabulous job of kind of setting the, setting the context for us, telling, about, telling us about some of the challenges of emerging technology, regula regulating emerging technologies. And um, our goal on this panel is to kind of, is to be, make that even more complicated. <laughs> uh, we don't do that out of mean spiritedness, but just, uh, just because uh, that's part of our mission here. So um, uh, I'm going to start out by saying um, that uh, I come to this as a political scientist, and we political scientists have, we used to have a saying in our profession, which was, all politics is local. And um, over the last 20 years or so, I would say that our saying has changed. Now we say, all governance is multi-level. <laughs> Some people still argue that it's all local, but I think now it's more likely that we argue that uh, um, governance operates at multiple levels, local, state, national. There's usually regional in there, various levels, international. Some of that came out in the prior panel. And, but what we want to do uh, in this panel is look at that in some greater detail. And um, when we say that all governance is multi-level, we mean not only that uh, regulatory governance is operating in multiple levels, but also we have begun to really try to d dissect the complex patterns of interaction across levels. So I, I think when we say all governance is multi-level, actually what we mean is that you can't really understand contemporary problems unless you can understand how they're operating at multiple levels. So we have selected, um, so in, in, this, in this panel, basically what we want to do is, is investigate that. And um, we wanna, we want, uh, we've selected panelists who can talk about regulation at different levels, but we also hope to get them talking with each other about how those different levels interact. And um, uh, there, this can, this is even a little bit more complicated in the sense that science innovation and uh, uh, regulation are operating at different levels and often at different, uh, not really matched very well. Environmental science has a good term for this. They talk about it as scale mismatch. So uh, I think uh, that partly came up uh, in some of the early presentations about some of the gaps we see in regulation. So <clears throat> we have a, a very distinguished uh, a group of panelists to talk about these issues. And so I'm just going to very briefly introduce them. Uh, this is in alphabetical order. So Naba um, Barkakati, I practiced that, but I <laughs> still got it wrong, <laughs> from the, <clears throat> the US General Accountability Office. He is the chief technologist for GAO. And he is also um, the co-director of their Center for Science, Technology, and Engineering. <clears throat> Edie Chang, we're uh, pleased to have. She is a uh, deputy executive officer with California, California's Air Resources Board. That's the organization that cleaned up the LA skies that, that, uh, that we saw in, Anne, in Anne's introduction, and also a UC uh, Berkeley grad. Uh, Go Bears. <laughs> Go Bears, right. <laughs> and and <more> blue. <laughs> and Jason Delborn, who is uh, uh, an old friend, and uh, so this is a nice chance to see him again who's an associate professor at the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State, and also a former UC grad. So uh, this is um, Cal Bears Week. And finally, Jonas Me last but not least, <laughs> Jonas Meckling, who is assistant professor of energy and environmental policy here at UC Berkeley in the ESPM program, Environmental Science Planning and Management. And uh, we're very, uh, Happy to have all of you here today to uh, to speak with us. I am going to go. I, I'm going to go basically in the order uh, that we have uh, on the agenda, and uh, I think there's two slideshows. You guys can organize that. I'm going to have them 
invite them to speak for about 10 minutes each, and then uh, we're going to have some dialogue like the last panel did between the, between the panelists, and then we'll open it up to you for some probing and provocative questions, and then at the, in the, uh, at the very end, I think I will come back and ask you to uh, provide any concluding thoughts that you have. So without further ado, let's go, let's begin, and I think, um, uh, Jonas, you are up, right? Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Chris, and um, I'll be speaking about the location of regulatory authority and of regulatory knowledge production in climate change. That is a big topic. Um, knowledge in climate uh, politics comes in on the problem side, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, understanding what the problem is. On the solution side, the various technologies, Jane Long talked about it, um, about knowledge about shale gas, knowledge about geoengineering. And there is this knowledge infrastructure that kind of mediates between the problem and the solution. It's greenhouse gas accounting, which is the knowledge infrastructure that uh, tells us how much do we emit and how much do certain technological options, as well as changes in practices, help us mitigate emission reductions. And because it is such a pervasive um, piece of uh, the climate change knowledge infrastructure, that's what I'll be focusing on. Um, a lot of people here on campus work on this in some way or the other. For instance, um, Wendy Silver, Dennis Baldot, she focused very much on land use change, greenhouse gas emissions, and they're very interested in what happens to the knowledge we produce. Um, and um, we have been asked in the prompts to look at how does the location of regulatory authority relate to the location of the knowledge production. And what I'll be laying out in climate change, it overlaps largely. So when I'm, what I'm, uh, the stories I'm telling are uh, both about knowledge production but also where mitigation policy is happening. Um, and I'll outline how this location shifted over the course of policy development from the emergence of climate policy to the maturation of the issue area. And I'll tell brief, three brief narratives. The first one is from private to public authority. The second one is from bottom up to top down regulation. The third one is from backstage to front stage regulatory politics. So let me start with the first one, from private to public authority. And it partially overlaps with uh, what Gary Marchand earlier laid out as soft law, hard law. Um, the very earliest um, accounting standards on greenhouse gas emissions were developed by private actors in a transnational setting. The World Resources Institute and the World Business Council on Sustainable Development developed the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Initiative in the late 1990s. That was a very small group of actors, three environmental NGOs slash think tanks and three large corporations. And um, this standard very quickly was taken up by um, public actors that especially at the subnational level started to develop mitigation policy, notably emissions trading schemes across the board in the UK emissions trading scheme, the UHS emission trading scheme, but also California's um, Climate um, Action um, Registry um, used this kind of standards. It was not just a, a copying, but definitely it was a key input to the public regulatory policy making process. Also more hybrid institutions such as the International Standards Organization that later developed its own standards, built it on what uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol Initiative had initially developed. So what are kind of the pros and cons of this private to uh, public shift? Um, I mean, in a certain way, it allowed very quick development of these standards and facilitated at the time a voluntary carbon market. So it allowed experimentation uh, in, in real time, um, but also it was extremely limited participation. It was not just elite, it was a very tiny group of lead organizations involved in setting the standard, which became a precedent for anything following later. So the second narrative is about from uh, top, bottom up to top down. So now we're in the public sphere. Both greenhouse gas accounting schemes, especially in climate registries, and mitigation policies emerged at the subnational level. We had this in the UK and in Denmark, um, in the EU, and um, here in the Northeast Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and California. Um, 
And um, then also, they all had their own kinds of registries, accounting standards. The Midwest was developing their own accounting standards. But then we saw, in the span of five to 10 years, the aggregation of these knowledge production structures at the national level, with the emergence of um, the climate registry that harmonized, facilitated greenhouse gas accounting in the US, and the emergence of a European-wide um, um, greenhouse gas accounting system in 2013. So and the climate registry was in 2007. Um, and now we're at this stage where we have moved from subnational to national, and most likely now international, with certain then top-down repercussions. The Paris Agreement, for the first time, made cl clear the intention that governments harmonize their monitoring, reporting, verification standards, which refers to the greenhouse gas accounting uh, part. The, uh, the goal is to do this by 2018 and then to have things implemented by 2020. So we see the reversal of this logic potentially after in this process, that the national and subnational um, knowledge structures have to be adjusted in terms of international agreements. So the pros of this um, development was, again, it allowed for a lot of subnational learning and experimentation. Um, and, um, and many of these um, issues had, I mean, there was fraud involved, and uh, uh, that all helped um, test out different methodologies. But it also created massive challenges in reliability and comparability of uh, regulatory efforts. Because um, uh, how do we know what uh, the accounting standards of another country are? I mean, for instance, um, the US uh, China Climate Agreement of 2014, one key piece of um, enabling that cooperation was a working level discussion of those um, knowledge structures. How does China arrive at its accounting? How does the US arrive at its accounting? Um, was part of this um, aggregation process. So the last narrative is from backstage to front stage. What do I mean with this? So backstage is refers here to technocratic politics in a closed circle without much public participation. And that's how many of these greenhouse gas accounting structures emerged uh, in very technical organizations with limited, uh, mostly um, business input in the U at the national level or the subnational level in, um, in the US. But then in 2011, we had a massive fraud in the European emissions trading scheme. And that suddenly brought in media attention, brought in various other interest groups. And the location of regulatory knowledge production became much more front stage. It was a much broader input and interest in this topic. Um, and it kind of this distinction cuts across a little bit about private versus public and various levels. But I think it's quite important from a legitimacy point of view. So to sum up here, um, I've looked at how the location of regulatory authority evolved over time in this emergent issue of climate change. And it's this trend from private to public, from bottom up to top down, and then increasingly broader participation in these um, endeavors. I'll leave it at this. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, Nava? Yeah, I have a slide, so I'll turn yeah. it on. Then we'll talk with you. Okay, it's ready. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about uh, the Government Accountability Office, GAO. Um, I mean, most of you know about it, and uh, I see our friend from FDA, so you'd know about it, of course, in the government agencies all know about it. Um, but <laughs> GAO, GAO has, was established in 1921, and it was focused on primarily financial accounting, but then over time, it has moved on to uh, a lot of uh, performance auditing, looking at government programs, how they function. And of course, in the course of that work, they have um, begun to have more and more of, since 90s or so, initially information technology, later on all kinds of you know, electronic systems, and even in the, any area you can think of has a lot of science technology aspects. So they had developed some group of people who could kind of help them with the science technology area. And so that's where I am in GAO, 
There's a group that takes care of looking at the methodologies. In fact, our group is mostly composed of social scientists and statisticians and economists and, uh, and a small portion is uh, science technology graduates and all for the purpose of uh, assisting GAO audits that have some questions in those areas so that you are providing the subject matter expertise or reviewing technical documents, et cetera. And apart from that work of assisting the, basically the audit work, we also have begun, well, this is, uh, Chris knows about this. We were asked to look at uh, technology assessments because the OTA was uh, disbanded, I mean, defunded rather, in uh, 1995 in Office of Technology Assessment. And then there was a lot of interest in Congress to look for some place to do some work in that area. So our group does some of that, but I say it with a lot of, you know, not claiming to be a great amount, mainly because the resources are limited to do that, and so it usually becomes small number. Now to tell you the one interesting point, I mean, uh, we had talked about the climate engineering, and we had looked at that too in 2011, and of course that's probably a good example to show that, you know, even though we have work done and report produced, not necessarily that something happens from it, but I can certainly say that we are kind of a conduit of knowledge produced anywhere else, uh, to Congress in reports. So since I don't have an expertise in a specific area, I'm gonna go through all three and using GAO's expertise and my own little bit background here and there, uh, meaning in, in a case of the other panelists, sometimes they have very much deaf, in-depth expertise in each of those domain areas. So drug device diagnostic, well, we already, FDA representative is here and we consider, of course, the GAO the, uh, by legislation who has the authority and it is so, Definitely squarely in the national, you know, low side, like if locus rather for uh, any regulation related to health safety, uh, these devices, Federal Food and Drug Administration in Health and Human Services has this responsibility. So, of course, we look at that uh, in terms of like their um, activities and how well they're doing. Uh, but one thing I thought was going to be relevant was in 2006, there was a question about just asking or looking into what are the factors that inhibit development of new drugs and uh, primarily drug actually. And so some of the findings based on expert input and consultation was that the lack of scientific uh, knowledge you know, in terms of uh, translating research into safe and effective drug. And the second one was that the uncertainty about the regulation that will be used to you know, approve the drug was some, one of the factors. And so that, for that actually FDA has in their strategic plan as a strategic issue, they focus on regulatory science, which is the science of like, helping understand or setting standards, et cetera, for the products they regulate. Uh, kind of like what we're talking about, but it's in the context of FDA's work. Right? And uh, I will end by saying, of course, we always criticize <laughs> you know, various agencies. There is something looking at that pro you know, their work in the regulatory science area, and it was considered to be good, and a lot of results coming out, but the lack of uh, tracking, you know, uh, like maybe strategically tracking the uh, progress towards results year over year that was lacking. So G GAO generally has a lot of recommendations of this sort where they say, please improve your you know, management and tracking of issues. But bottom line is the regulatory science would be an important aspect, right, for drug and device development. So moving to the next topic, which is the climate change uh, mitigation area. Um, in, this, in this area, actually, after we're our geoengineering report, you know, 2011, I mean, GAO, of course, is a nonpartisan agency but works for Congress, so we are conscious of the you know, political issues also, even though we would remove them when doing the work. Uh, but there is, of course, understanding that this <laughs> climate change is not even acknowledged sometimes, or sometimes they are. It's a very controversial issue. So we, we try to take this approach where uh, we, have put, we have a high-risk list. I mean, we create a list of high-risk programs in government and or issue areas, and this happens to be phrased in the way that the fiscal uh, responsibility of the government is going to be affected by climate change. Therefore, limiting that fiscal exposure is the angle that we have been taking to bring this issue to the forefront and do work where you can, not necessarily saying tremendously the climate change, this or that, that it's happening and how can government adapt or you know, how can government uh, mitigate the risk. And it is usually often presented in the context of all the other hazards also. When I say that, I mean, you know, terrorism, anything you call, you know, not necessarily only climate related, but everything else that can be put into a bu uh, list of all the hazards, and then looking at the making systems, making the whole, whatever the program or approach or system is, are more resilient. And resilient, of course, means that you'll be able to um, suffer through the, you know, hardships and come out 
uh, alive, basically. You know, you, you, you'll be resilient in the systems have something built in that are, that's going to help them succeed in doing that. And in that area, we did look at what the um, federal government has done. Of course, legislation, nothing has happened there. But in the executive branch, the president has, of course, taken action with certain areas, you know, uh, trying to, for instance, have there's some coordinating groups and all for all federal action in that area. So there's actions that have been taken to improve resilience. So, so it's phrased always as the, to remove the fiscal, uh, to l limit and minimize the fiscal um, exposure of government, you know, in this area. And then uh, finally, we had looked at some of the other government's activities in this area. Um, uh, UK, I mean, look at the documentation, documents on their plans and laws. So UK, European Union, Mexico, Philippines, Netherlands, and those five are the cases, actually. We were noticing and noticing in the report, officially, that um, there has been uh, coordinated plans, long-term plans, and strategies developed by those countries, including enacting laws, which have helped them coordinate their efforts. So what I'm saying in these cases is that these are the ways we put in information towards Congress to you know, initiate that, potentially action. They can always take it as, and they generally trust the GAO's vetted information as something good to use as a basis. But it depends whether they have the will or not. That's a different story. And then finally, the nanoscale material innovation. Of course, in that area, um, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, of course, my personal opinion on climate adaptation, uh, mitigation, of course, would be climate change mitigation has multiple loci, obviously, in national, all the way down to individuals. I mean, and, and it happens to be ha you know, occurring in that manner. People might take action on their own, right? Or localities might take action on their own. So that's just the lo loci part. And in this case, of course, the national level attention to nas nanotechnology has been there for a long, long time. In 2001, we had the National Nanotechnology Initiative, NNI. It still is going on, but maybe there's reauthorization or something pending. 2003, there was the Na Nanotechnology Research and Development Act passed. And that included actually some things about you know, looking into health, health safety effects and also for, you know, for uh, nanotechnology. So in that sense, the intent was there in that law. And over time, over all these years, um, 20 billion plus dollars have been uh, given through you know, various mechanisms, research and all, to work on that nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. And of course, by now, we, have, we heard from previous panels, researchers, there's a lot of um, commercialization happening, right? You know, about products containing nanomaterials primarily has happened. And in that area, um, we had the forum of experts conducted uh, about two years ago, and uh, the experts noted that there's a, a potential effects of environmental health, safety, the standard things that we look at of nanomaterials was not uh, fully understood. And we also had looked at EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, because of course that's where we go typically for chemical substance, things like that. And they, they had challenges, you know, our report had noted that they had challenges in understanding the effect because the research isn't all there. Uh, so finally there was some recommendation in those reports asking FDA, uh, EPA rather, sorry, to look into this area, you know, how do you regulate the nanomaterials you know, effect, even if you don't know the effect. So uh, the recommendations were made in like 2010, but by now, 2016, their uh, EPA is planning to release a uh, rule that will require companies that use nanomaterials to report. So this is not quite regulating, but it's uh, basically reporting because they don't really know how to regulate uh, officially, you know, without the standards and all. So very bottom line is, of course, there's a lot of activities in all these areas, and in many cases, there's a lack of scientific knowledge, actually, which is a problem a lot of times. And it's never a problem if it exists somewhere else to be able to uh, corral all that knowledge together to feed it in a report to Congress, but, and then that's one mechanism by which some, some of the research work gets into Congress. And then regulatory science is another aspect which seems like those who are regulatory agencies could adopt and, uh, you know, to, to try to develop their own standards for things they regulate, basically. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jason Delborn. Um, I'm actually a, a graduate of uh, the ESPEN program here at Berkeley. Uh, it's environmental science policy and management. Um, it's really nice to be back here uh, giving a talk in a professional capacity. That's very fun for me. Um, I'm at North Carolina State University uh, as part of uh, the Genetic Engineering and Society Center, which is an interdisciplinary effort to think about social, ethical, and political issues around genetic engineering um, and advanced biotechnologies. I'm going to take a bit of a, a deep dive into a particular issue um, to think about this issue of 
of uh, appropriate levels of regulatory oversight. And I'll talk about uh, my recent experience being part of a National Academies panel that looked at um, gene drive research in non-human organisms. Um, and we released this report um, just this past June. Uh, it's going to be tough for me not to go all the way into the details because I find this area really exciting um, and I don't want to assume too much knowledge. But what I'll try to do is just give you enough background to understand the points I want to make about the locus of regulation. Um, so to that end, um, in case you don't know what gene drives are, um, they're systems of biased inheritance, which means that um, if you look at this graph, uh, Mendelian inheritance is on the left, which is what, st what happens um, with regular sexual reproduction where genes are inherited by half of the offspring on average. With a gene drive system, um, the inheritance is biased, which means that a particular trait is more than 50% likely to appear in the, next, in the next generation. And if it's really effective, what you essentially have is a trait that's driven through a population so that it takes over a population. Um, and what's important to recognize about this field is that um, in terms of applications, it's really all over the map. Um, I won't go into each of these examples, even though I think they're pretty fascinating, but we have applications in public health, such as um, engineering mosquitoes to not transmit malaria and then driving that trait through populations, conservation uh, with gene drive systems in invasive rodents to crash population, populations of rodents on islands to protect biodiversity, um, gene drives in agriculture to change the behavior or change the populations of pests, um, and also in basic research um, in terms of being able to, to ask more basic questions about inheritance and genetics. The key thing to, to, I want you to, to keep in mind uh, for when I talk about governance of these, of these technologies is that gene drives are intended to spread and persist in the environment. Um, and that makes them different from the GMOs that we have faced up to this point. And I'll come back to that a couple of times. Um, in terms of, of scales of governance, I think what's interesting about this case is that it, it, it operates at many different scales. Um, and I, I don't have time to talk about all of these, um, but they're all pretty interesting, ranging from molecular strategies of containment, which is essentially how can we change the way that gene drives work so that they don't spread, um, and there are a couple of interesting ways to do that, or how could we recall them with genetic techniques. Through professional ethics and guidelines, there have been some, uh, some really interesting publications by groups of social scientists and gene drive researchers calling for discussions about how to innovate in responsible ways around this technology. It's, it's quite a new technology. Um, and those, those conversations are starting, uh, or were starting, just at the point that proof of concept was coming out in laboratories. Um, I'll talk then a little bit about some community processes. Um, there's opportunities for governance at, at the level of municipal governments. I mean, we might think about current controversies around GM mosquitoes in Florida um, and that there's uh, you know, referendum, a referendum plan uh, in the Keys and the decision will be made by the Mosquito Control District, um, which is interesting to think about. Um, that being the locus of decision making for the first environmental release of, um, of GM mosquitoes in our country. Um, through to federal guidelines, federal regulations, and international agreements and guidelines. So for community processes, I think this is one of the most interesting uh, parts of this story. This is a picture of Kevin Esfelt, who's um, at the forefront of, uh, of gene drive research. Um, and he is, his, he's making um, lots of assertions about how gene drive research should be different from what we've seen in modern biotechnology research, which I, I could talk about for a long time. But what I'll talk about specifically is that he's very committed to the idea of engaging publics and stakeholders about the research. Um, and so he went, uh, this is a, some pictures and, and text from the Vineyard Gazette. Um, he went to Martha's Vineyard and made a presentation to a community group about the possibility um, of using a gene drive technology to change the way that Lyme disease operates in the environment. I um, mean, what's really interesting about this particular uh, engagement by a scientist is he didn't already have the technology in hand. Um, he actually hasn't done any work beyond thinking of the idea on, uh, on, on these, I believe it's deer mice. Um, instead, he went to the community first to, to gauge their interest. And the, his idea is we shouldn't even start doing this if there isn't community buy-in and investment and appreciation for this technology. Um, that's a really different kind of model that 
you know, is bringing the expertise of, of the technical expertise that Asphalt has, but a recognition that there's a context for the deployment of that kind of innovation um, that will be affected by community support or rejection. Uh, the next level I want to talk about um, are what we might think of as federal guidelines. Um, and our, our, our report talked, uh, we did a lot of investigation of institutional biosafety committees and how they might regulate gene drive research um, as it continues. Um, these IBCs uh, focus on health and environmental safety. And one of the good things about them as a, as a guideline organization is that they offer a very flexible approach. Um, so they rely on expertise within those IBCs um, at universities and such. Um, they're required at NIH funded institutions, so that's a lot of us. Um, there is a question though of whether they are prepared to deal with the novel characteristics of gene drives. Um, one of them being um, the way that they might spread in, in uh, wild populations. Um, and when we talked to people who were on IBCs and who knew a lot about how they operated, there was not confidence um, that those IBCs had the expertise um, or the resources to be able to deal with applications for gene drive research. In a sense, there was a worry that, that the particular uh, characteristics of gene drive research would just be missed by these IBCs, even though there's a fair amount of expertise there. Um, there is a lack of clear guidelines for this new emerging field of research. And the other thing that our committee noted was that institutions and industrial labs not funded by NIH um, are not bound by the IBCs. Um, and so while we might take great confidence in a particular institutional arrangement, if it doesn't apply broadly, um, it raises a question mark. Um, I'll talk briefly about federal regulations, uh, which um, I'll, spe I'll specifically talk about the coordinated framework for the regulation of biotechnology, um, which was updated in 1992. And as you may know, there are current discussions about up updating that framework, recognizing um, that it's inadequate for what we have now. Um, I think one of the interesting things about that conversation is that both proponents and opponents of biotechnology are very excited to revisit the framework for, for very different reasons. Um, and so uh, in terms of how this works out in an election year, um, there's a lot of questions. Um, but under the coordinated framework, um, thus far, GMOs have been uh, regulated under USDA, EPA, and FDA, and occasionally NEPA and the Center for Disease Control um, if it's triggered. Um, even with, uh, I mean, with, with meta, many emerging um, gene editing techniques um, like CRISPR, and especially with gene drive, um, there's a lack of clear ju jurisdiction, um, and there's some overlap. There are questions, for example, we looked at a case study of a, of a gene drive mouse. Um, that might be regulated under FDA because it's, um, the, the trait is considered an animal drug. Um, it might be regulated by the EPA because the mouse is actually designed to crash the population of mice, so it could be considered a rodenticide. Um, and it might be regulated by USDA because mice are a plant pest and USDA's oversight of GMOs are triggered by, um, the, by, by whether there's a plant pest aspect to the GMO. Um, what's missing, for example, in that case is what about fish and wildlife? Are they, are they triggered? Um, for these new applications of gene drives that focus on conservation, um, an, you know, an agency like Fish and Wildlife would seem to be key, but it's not part of this um, standard coordinated framework. Um, and on issues of dual use, Homeland Security would seem to be a relevant um, body to engage as well. A, a point about our, our regulatory framework is that it's very much focused on containment and confinement in terms of testing and uh, managing the risks of GMOs. And gene drives are meant to not be contained and not be confined. Um, and in fact, it's very difficult to think about achieving those ends even during a testing phase. Um, and so in a sense, our regulatory framework is predicated on an idea of controlling a technology that doesn't match what this technology offers. Uh, and our committee um, made, made the case for what, uh, what we call the, an ecological risk assessment, which goes beyond things like environmental assessments or even environmental impact statements. And a couple of things, um, uh, and, and the argument that our, our committee made was that the current coordinated framework doesn't make clear that this is the kind of risk assessment that needs to happen. Um, some of the benefits of an ecological risk assessment are to compare multiple strategies uh, to address uncertainty with probability estimates, um, to incorporate stakeholder and public engagement, um, and to consider uh, in the risk literature what's called multiple stressors and endpoints, basically recognizing the complexity of the environment 
um, and the multiple, multiple things at play. And quickly, if I'm doing okay on time, I'll just talk about a little bit about international agreements and guidelines. Um, this is a, an area of high uncertainty um, in terms of the regulation of gene drive research and organisms. Um, there was a recognition by our committee that the WHO, World Health Organization guidelines on GM mosquito research, which were published in 2014, are very relevant and helpful here. Um, and in fact, our committee adapted um, one of their ideas, which is a kind of phased approach uh, for testing um, as, a, as a way to move forward with gene drive research. Um, certainly, the, the CBD and the, the Cartagena and Nagoya protocols are part of this picture. Um, and I think what our committee noted was that there's, uh, that, that even among uh, countries that have signed on to these protocols, there are very different regulatory regimes that range from being more preventative to more permissive. Um, and so while these large protocols may provide some sort of guidance about what we should worry about, um, they don't uh, provide clear guidelines about how to proceed with gene drive research. And really importantly, this technology will not respect political boundaries. Um, so uh, one of the issues here, um, of course, is that uh, you know, a technology like a gene drive modified organism released into the environment um, will cross into uh, cross sovereign boundaries of indigenous groups who may have completely different regimes of thinking about governing um, these types of organisms. Um, another particular example that our committee noted was that there, there's an interest in the agricultural sector of using gene drive um, to uh, transform uh, palmer pigweed, or uh, palmer amaranth, which is also called pigweed, which is a, a problematic weed in the US that is no longer res uh, responding to glyphosate. Um, and if you could essentially re-engineer that wild population to be sensitive to glyphosate or to um, uh, or to actually crash the population with a, a, a gene drive. Um, that would be attractive to US farmers, but if that trait were to cross the border into Mexico, where a closely related food, um, a, a different kind of amaranth, but that can reproduce with palmer amaranth, uh, is used as a food. So you could essentially be crashing a population in one place that's a weed, and that trait then crosses the border and is crashing a population that is not a weed, but is a food. Um, so, just to remind you, you know, this is the, 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 the many, many different scales of governance that are at play here um, with a lot of uncertainty about what the interactions are going to be um, and what's going to proceed. And one of the questions that, that we were asked to think about is where is scientific expertise here? Um, and I think it's tempting to say um, that we see much more scientific expertise at the, at the top um, where, with professional ethics and guidelines, with efforts by scientists to come together and set their own rules, um, and then less and less as we move toward international agreements and guidelines. I'm not sure about that. I wonder whether we are confusing the question of scientific expertise and scientific authority. So one of the points that we made as a committee is that the, the governance of gene drive uh, research and deployment is a scientific question, but it's also a political question. And issues of human values are at play at every stage of research and development and release of these organi organisms. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing to worry about whether appropriate scientific expertise is playing a role in the political decisions we make about this research, but we should be careful that we're not wringing our hands about that when we're actually concerned about whether or not scientists are in charge of making those decisions. Um, and I think Reminding ourselves of that difference is an important part of our conversation today. Thank you, Jason. Edie. All right, so I'm Edie Chang. I'm with the California Air Resources Board. I'm going to move this back a little bit. Um, so you've already gotten a little bit of a window into what we do, and I would say that our communications director is probably really thrilled. I texted him. I said, hey, I'm at this conference in Berkeley, and they're showing one of your videos on the screen. So he was actually thrilled already. Um, I kind of feel like this, is, this has been a really, really interesting morning already for me because this is a little bit, everything that everyone's talking about here, we're sort of the living laboratory of it. So um, we are, uh, you have a little bit of an idea of what we do, but let me tell you a little bit about sort of how we do it and how we're situated. Um, obviously, we're a state agency, so we're part of California state government. 
I report to a board of 14, actually I report to the executive officer, but he reports to a board of 14 members that are, um, 12 of them are appointed by the governor and two of them are appointed by the legislature. There was just legislation passed in this last legislative session that's adding two more board members to our board. They're non-voting ex officio members and they're going to be members of the legislature. So, but we're definitely a state government um, organization. Our history, we're gonna be 50 years old next year and our history is that we started off as an air quality organization and that was really our focus. Um, we, are, we operate at the state level. Um, the Air Resources Board has been around and regulating cars, for example, since before you know, EPA was paying attention to those cars. Um, but basically, um, the, system in, um, the system in the United States is the EPA sets through the Clean Air Act sort of these broad mandates for what you're gonna do. They set national ambient air quality standards and they have a panel of scientists and they decide Here's how clean the air is in order for it to be considered healthful. And then we go through a process and decide which areas are dirty and polluted, and then they tell the states, okay, you guys come up with plans to decide how you're gonna clean the air. So in California, we're that agency. So we're the agency under the Clean Air Act that we're the ones that have to figure out how we're gonna clean the air. Um, we have very unique authority from any other state in the country because we started regulating cars first. We get to regulate cars. Nobody else in the country gets to regulate cars besides uh, the emission standards of cars except for California and the US EPA. And so there have been times when our standards have been different from theirs, and we, but we try to work together because to the extent that we can get these cleaner cars through the whole rest of the country, that's really valuable. Um, other states have the option, they can pick our standards or they can pick the EPA standards. So the car manufacturers really want those standards to be identical or as close as possible because they don't want to make two cars, they want to make one car. So this is a really powerful thing for us and we've worked with EPA to sort of leverage this. Um, but it does give us a position where we think beyond our borders. We're not just a state agency that thinks about what we do in California. We've been forced, because other states do adopt our standards, to think about what does this mean for the rest of the country. And so that's one of the tensions that we experience. Um, in 2006, the legislature passed AB 32, which basically said, hey, California is going to do something about climate change. And they said Air Resources Board is going to be the agency that oversees those efforts. So um, we had not really been involved in climate change before that. We had adopted some vehicle standards for CO2 based on some earlier legislation, but we took on this new um, role and responsibility. And I think that's where a lot of folks have heard about us since then. And this really um, sort of, because climate change is an international issue, um, we've, we've sort of had to rethink our view a little bit about what we are and what we do, and we really do have, a, I think, a global and an international view now. From a technical perspective, we've always had folks that come talk to us about, you know, how do you make cars cleaner? How do you make fuels cleaner? But we've had a huge upsurge in requests from international delegations to come talk with us about what we're doing in California in the climate change fight. Um, we also, we have a cap and trade program in California to limit greenhouse gas emissions, and that program is linked with the province of Quebec. So we have a subnational link with another country. So we are forced to look at what's going on. You know, when Trudeau was elected in Canada, you know, we start asking questions. Are they gonna go to a carbon tax? What does this mean for our system? We're forced to pay attention to what's happening in other um, states and other countries in the rest of the world. And so I think that really does affect our view. Um, we have a staff of about 1,300 and they're scientists and engineers by and large. Um, we're a very science-based organization with, I would characterize as deep connections to the UCs and the other research institutions in California. Um, I talked about that. Uh, and I think that one of the things that makes us different a little bit from other government organizations even that are here is that because EPA is setting a goal for us, so they're saying, in Los Angeles, this is the parts per million of ozone that are allowed in the air, and you have until 2031 to get there. We're in the position when we develop these plans that what we're doing is we're pushing technology. 
So you've probably heard of some of these requirements that we have. So the very, very first program I worked on when I started working at the Air Resources Board was our zero emission vehicle program. So this is our electric car program. And that was in 1993. And in 1993, we said, we need 2% of the cars in California to be electric by 1998. So that program has gone through lots and lots of different um, variations. We've been working really closely with you know, battery manufacturers and car manufacturers. And we hit, I think, 2.5% of new car sales were electric last year in 2015. So we've got the long view. We have to have the long view on these things. And I think this goes to um, some of the conversations that we were having this morning. And I wrote down a couple of the things that sort of resonated with me. Um, one of them was the need for to be flexible as you're setting standards and the need to go back and look at how things are doing. Many, I would say most of our major regulations have a, a feedback mechanism built in. So we actually have a formal process where we go back to our board every two years or every three years or on some schedule that's in the rule that we adopted and we have to do a technology assessment. We have to do a formal report often in a broad stakeholder process, in a public process to see do we need to make modifications. So obviously in the history of our zero emission vehicle program between 1993 and 2016, we've made numerous modifications to that program. We go back every two years and look at how's the technology coming along. Um, one of the other themes that really resonated with me, and we've talked about it here, is um, the, the role of um, the community and community information. Oh, I forgot to stop my, start my stopwatch, so I have no idea where I am. <laughs> um, community access and equity. And this is becoming, I think it's, you know, we're a public health organization at our core. We're providing clean air to Californians. But the whole issue about who has access to information, how they participate in the public process, how they participate in our decision making is becoming a bigger and bigger issue for us, I think, as well as everybody else. Um, there were some conversations earlier about sort of how do we balance um, the benefits of new technologies and the risks of new technologies. And government is one of the places that we do that. It's probably not the only place and it probably shouldn't be the only place. But that's what our board does every month when they consider regulations. So they're looking at a regulation that we've given to them and we say, well, we can implement this zero emission vehicle program. Here's what it's gonna cost. Here's just what it's gonna cost the auto manufacturers. And you know, we shouldn't have any, um, we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, be cute about it. Those costs are gonna get passed on somewhere, right? They can't just swallow all of those costs. So what does that do to the cost of other vehicles? What does that do to how people drive? What does that do to, these are all the things that we're trying to think about and that our board has to balance when they make decisions. Um, one of the other things that struck me was sort of some of the governance issues that we've been talking about here. Um, this whole idea of sort of soft laws and guidelines, and we really do rely on professional organizations, on scientific organizations to help us in many areas. So, you know, a lot of the work that we do is automotive with, and we, there's a lot of work that the Society of Automotive Engineers does in setting different kinds of standards. We have a, um, you, we call it the mill light, you probably call it the check engine light. So when the emission controls on your car goes off, that little light comes on. That's a light that we told them, hey, you gotta put that in so if your emission control goes bad, that light uh, turns on. There is an entire whole part of SAE now that just talks about how do we do the communication protocols for that OBD so that there's some consistency in the automotive industry. So we definitely rely on the expertise of the private sector in moving forward in some of these areas, but there are some areas, I think, and this is a judgment call for us, has the private sector stepped in and, and, and done things and we're comfortable that we're okay, or are there places that we have to jump in and do things? Um, uh, one of the other things, and I think this goes with sort of balancing the risks, is um, unintended consequences. And I think this is a big challenge for all of us. Um, we've been in situations we try hard to think about all of the issues that could come up and how do we make sure that we don't exacerbate any circumstances. But there have been issues that have come up that we've had to deal with 
you know, um, after the fact. And I think probably the most famous one is MTBE and gasoline. So we required gasoline that when you burn it doesn't produce as much smog. It turns out the MTBE that was put into that gasoline, once it, you know, if it gets into a leaking gasoline tank, it's miscible with water, it, it, it contaminated different water sources. And it, but it did lead to obviously a better, a better understanding on our part and um, a regulatory structure that now requires multimedia assessments and a lot more formal coordination with our counterparts in other environmental organizations. So we can't obviously go back and fix that problem, but there are more safeguards that have been put in place and I think that we are all getting smarter about those kinds of things right now. Um, so I'm gonna close out um, right there, I think. Um, I think that there is a commonality, and I think this has come up a little bit here about how we all talk about science and technology and how do we communicate that with lay people, um, with the communities. Um, it's already, I think it's a jump when we as regulators talk to scientists, right? So we take the, the science and we have to translate it into a form that we can figure out how we think about regulations and how we, how we might implement that. And then take the next step to talk with the public about it in a way that's really understandable. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have right now is not just talking to the industry groups and the lobbyists and the scientists and the academics that do this every single day, but I think there is, there's so much more information out there and we all need to do a better job of figuring out how we talk to, to just sort of everyday people that don't have as much of a science background. Um, so, you know, our challenge is how do we improve the air, address the climate change problem while trying to come up with a solution that works for communities, works for the state, works for, works for us nationally and internationally while minimizing those harms. So I'm really interested in having more conversation here and with all of you today. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to give, uh, for the next little while, I'd like to give the panel uh, some chance to talk among themselves uh, and kind of maybe think about the commonalities between, which has already begun to kind of bubble up, but to think about the commonalities in, in what they're experiencing and thinking about, and or maybe the differences. So I thought I would maybe start with Jonas's um, idea that there's three narratives. I thought that was kind of nifty. And um, he said that uh, he saw in, in his area, he saw uh, a, a kind of a pattern, a shift from private to public, from bottom up to top down, um, and from backstage to front stage negotiations. And I think it's kind of interesting just to, to ask the other three panelists, but their, their, uh, their cases or multiple cases in uh, Naba's uh, uh, case, they might, be not quite fit this, but it, I think it's just kind of interesting to push it a little bit to see to see uh, to see how general that is. That a general pattern for emerging technology regulation of emerging technologies, or is that for this particular one? So, um, so I'm not going to throw it out to to Jonas, but to the other three and see if they have anything. And then and then we'll open it. To, you guys can ask each other questions after that. Yeah. Well, I, like I, I, I think I think there probably is some com commonality, but what, what struck me, one of the interesting things as you were going through the um, sort of the, the narratives is, as you talked about sort of the accounting protocols moving from a bottom up uh, to a top down, kind of moving from uh, a lot of folks doing it to having more centralized uh, international protocols. What I was thinking is it's interesting because I think that in a way what we've seen over over the last 10 years is the climate action has actually moved from a top down to a bottom up. So we're seeing sort of a different, um, we're seeing things sort of go in different directions because out of the Kyoto Protocol, there was sort of this idea that, you know, this was gonna be something the UN did and countries were all gonna sign on. And what we've seen more and more is there's a lot of energy at the subnational level that cities and subnational jurisdictions are signing on to take action. And in many cases, and you know, I think the US is an example where states are really leading countries. And I think that was happening in Canada for a long time too. So I thought that was an interesting dichotomy that um, the, where the regulation was happening in terms of policy action didn't necessarily match like where the technical um, uh, regulation was. 
So I'll just comment on, uh, of course, you know, GAO, when it looks at it, it intends to be something that Congress is either considering or wants to do. And in those cases, a lot of times for emerging technology, uh, I mean, uh, often uh, there is no really, uh, unless it's already worked out and there's some uh, clear cut data showing, showing some effect, you know, that needs regulating, uh, it doesn't come up easily, you know, to the uh, radar of Congress. And we also can't really comment on it unless uh, there is some study done where, where data or study has shown that you know, there will be some negative effect and we could document it then. And the whole process is a little bit along those lines. So in that sense, the more the private sector private, you know, or other dis distributed manner, if it gets done and it's pr uh, prevalent everywhere, then <laughs> that can be brought to bear at the you know, centralized uh, top-down manner eventually. So that's observation. I guess my, my comment is just a little bit more theoretical or just a question back to Jonas, actually. When, when you were describing those three trends, um, I wonder if they're independent or if they're um, interdependent. Um, so for example, can you have a move from pri private to public authority, but a move at the same time that's you would describe as moving from top down to bottom up? Or, or is this sort of a, a shift, and I would argue that maybe it shifts back and forth some, where you have uh, you know, less formal, more private, more backstage, more bottom-up work that happens, and that's differentiated from something that is more public, more top-down, more front stage, um, and that we could describe certain moments of governance as being somewhere on that spectrum, but that maybe our challenge um, for as analysts is to figure out which of those kinds of characteristics tend to go together and which might be combined in different ways um, that would offer novel forms for governance um, that might make things better. You want to respond, Jonas? Yeah, maybe quickly to, to Jason's comments. I think it's a really interesting question. Do we see these um, the private uh, bottom-up and backstage align? I think that's a question. Are there are there private processes um, of rulemaking of standard setting that are much more participatory, that are more front stage, versus more private? Um, and I think it's more of an empirical question. Um, do what do we see is more prevalent? Um, on um, the, the point that uh, Edie made, um, the kind of disjuncture between the international process and then um, this entire politics around greenhouse gas emission, uh, accounting happening at the domestic level. And I think what's really interesting is this disconnect between the international process, meaning Kyoto at the time, being very much concerned with regulatory targets, but where the implementation was happening, suddenly the knowledge problem became much more prevalent. Mm -hmm. So Kyoto didn't have to concern itself with that, but then California had to concern itself when it said, okay, we really actually want to um, have a committee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Interesting. So uh, other questions for each other? How about that, or comments on each other's uh, presentation? Or? I, have, I have a question yeah. I'd like to pose. So I think what, what I was thinking about in the, in the first panel was um, what sort of organizational forms do we have to do this, to deal with these um, challenges of governance? Um, and how do we study them? Um, and I was aware that it seemed to me that, that uh, Edie and Naba are, were, were essentially offering two particular examples um, of, of trying to solve this. Um, you know, whether you like it or not, you are a locus of regulation, um, GAO maybe you know, out of desperation. Um, but uh, in, in thinking about that and the, and the point, um, Edie, that you raised about public participation, I wanted to ask if you could think about each of you, you have a particular organizational form that's, that's trying to operate in this area of governance of emerging technologies. Um, and you recognize the importance of public participation. And I wonder if you could comment about um, whether when, you, when your organization seeks more public input and participation, participation, participation by stakeholders and publics, does the quality of the expertise that feeds into the policy making or decision making go down? I think that's a central concern about public participation and one of the questions that guides this panel. And I can say one thing, you know, um, we were looking into the technology assessment work and 
the European, they, they, have, they have, you know, European Parliamentary Technology Assessment, there's a group. There were, a lot of countries have adopted OTA kind of approach and they were doing it. So just to get to the point quickly, that Denmark, I guess, were, was involved in the, you know, participatory kind of uh, technology assessment, whereas we were mostly doing expert-based, like expert input, but they had some topics, I think, are, lend themselves so well to that, like the biodiversity, there was a whole exercise done here, right? And ASU, they were all involved too. And so, I guess uh, sometimes the participatory part might be important for things like if you're going to do like geoengineering or, or climate, you know, biodiversity maintaining or something. Those areas is more important maybe because it's very clear. The science part is not so clear at all. So oftentimes, sometimes, so the, you may get all the input that you can get. And I should say that you know, even in our work, uh, most of the time, GAO does a lot of these uh, good, you know, surveys. Um, there's a whole team to do that. So. Congress seems to be quite interested in knowing what the public thinks, you know, through a survey or something, if you find it, some official result on like, oh, are they for it or against it, just like any poll, right? They're very interested in it. So I feel like there would be, there'll be some way to influence if there is public opinion that's uh, obtained in one of these questions that, yeah, they prefer this or they prefer that, whatever it happens to be, so. And I guess I would offer that, um when we're making decisions, and I think this is probably true of every, every government agency, you're really balancing a lot of different things. So it's not, it, it, it's not, it's sort of just a, it, it's not just sort of a scale. There's a lot of different things. And so one of them is the, the science and, and understanding sort of how well developed that is and how solid that is. Um, but there's also cost. There's also, you know, for us things like, can you implement it? Um, there are safety issues, and there's issues that I think that as we expand the group of people that we're talking to, we, I think we have a responsibility to be able to explain the science in a way that's under, that, that is understandable to them. But I think in a way what we're looking for is what are the pieces that are important to them? So what is their, how, you know, how do they rate, um, you know, sort of the, the risk of something happening and how do you balance that against what the benefit is? And I think there was an example in the earlier panel about someone who was saying, you know, there, was a, there are cases where um, the FDA has said, oh, that risk is too great for this drug and the people who are suffering from the disease say, no, it's not. You know, you don't have this disease. I think the risk is okay. And I think that that's actually a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting um, way to think about it. I think one of the challenges for us is um, you are, there's geographic location specific issues. And so the big challenge is, you know, there are people who live by certain things. And so, we may be looking at sort of this greater societal good, but the people who live in that area are saying, well, okay, that's great. You have this greater societal good. What about the risk to me and my family? And I think that's the place where it gets very challenging. I was actually very interested in the example that you gave about uh, the gentleman who was doing the um, community sort of outreach Lyme. on the Lyme disease and the mice. And um, I think it's really interesting that he went to talk to a community before anything had happened. But I was also was thinking, well, that's one community. You know, what about all the other communities all around the country or around the world? Because I would imagine that once you have a little you know, little mouse that can do this, it's pretty hard to say, okay, I'm just going to do it in this area that I've had this community forum in. Uh, you know, how do you, part of this is a, um, just a logistics question, right? How, who, who represents who? And how do you decide who can speak for enough people that you have a really good survey of what we think? And I don't know how you, that's one of the things that I think we really struggle with. One more round of discussion, or if, if anyone has any, and then we'll open it up for public participation. Yeah. Just a quick, I think that, I think you're, you really raise an important point and that the, the model of informed consent mm -hmm. is, in, is inadequate. Um, and I think that these are political decisions that have to be made. And the question is what, what forms of political decision making do we have to make those tough decisions that are going to affect, you know, large geographies of people? I don't know Just a, a note on the, a detail about the case is that one of the reasons why Asphalt wants to do the, the uh, gene drive mouse in this situation is that it's an island. Um, and so the idea is that this is, a, this is a very good place to test this technology because it's an island. 
because it's a, a, a highly educated community. So you're, he's not charged with going over into a developing country and exposing people with less power and less status to a technology. Um, the US regulatory framework is seen as one of the stronger frameworks in the world. So again, he's not, he's not vulnerable to being accused of shopping around his technology somewhere where it will be accepted and not opposed. So there's, there's a whole bunch of strategic decisions that he's made um, to think about that. Not that it's a perfect solution, but it's mm -hmm. quite interesting. Yeah. Do you guys have any more burning questions for each other, or should we open it for the... Uh... Yeah. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. Conrad, uh, and then over to Jane, but uh, yeah, Conrad here, guy with the uh, yellow vest, or is that yellow? More bone white, actually. Uh, so Conrad Posh, I'm a poli-sci uh, PhD candidate here at Berkeley, but I'm also a car enthusiast. <laughs> so involving those two identities, I'm going to pose a specific issue and then try to make it a little more general. The first is, I'm glad we have someone from CARB here. Uh, and it's interesting to hear that you know a lower level agency often talks about being more responsive to the public, and you guys have all talked about that a lot in the last back and forth. But CARB famously, or perhaps infamously among car enthusiasts, is extremely antagonistic to any kind of car modifications. And it's often portrayed as requiring sort of, you know, what would we call uh, technology-based regulation as opposed to performance-based regulation, wherein you require CARB certification to change any single part on your car. Now, this is a bit over the top, because you can change a lot without CARB caring, and you can get away with a lot without CARB caring, so long as your tailpipe doesn't emit smog, and that's a good thing. But it's interesting. I thought that was a good sort of way into the idea that we often think about lower down and multi-level governance as being somehow more responsive the lower down you get. And yet we see in CAR, which does many good things, don't get me wrong, being antagonistic to certain stakeholders because they don't fit a certain sort of broader narrative of you know, preserving the air resources preventing, or protecting the environment. And I wanted to, I guess, suggest that in addition to disruptive innovation or innovation for brand new technologies, there's also the idea of combinatorial innovation, the idea of taking existing technologies putting them together in new ways. And for a specific example, engine swaps in cars, right? You have, you're taking a, uh, an engine from one car, putting it into another, and CARB has some good guidelines on that. But one sort of hole in that is not accepting expertise from other countries, right? Any engine that's been certified by CARB is fine to swap into a car so long as it's better than the one that was there before. But any engine that was certified by, say, the Japanese authorities, which probably could be translated into CARB, is essentially illegal, and I know that's not perfectly true, but that is definitely the perspective. So that was what I wanted to bring up, is that how do we bring in expertise from other communities, and how does that fit in with this idea of multi-level governance? So um, I always hate it when, when someone says we're antagonistic to something, because we're, we're trying not to be antagonistic, and I think this is, this is a case of balancing, and we have a whole group of people that look at aftermarket parts, and you talked about the engine swaps, and I, I guess I would, I could have been more pithy and just say I think the, the one word answer that I would give to you in, turn, in terms of our kind of concern is Volkswagen. You know, no, but what I'm saying is in terms of, in, in, in terms of, in terms of accepting other regulatory agencies sort of certifications that this thing is okay. And so I think that we would have a concern do we have to research all of these other things and understand all of the niceties and the ins and outs of, you know, so as, you know, maybe we've taken a more conservative approach on this. I think it's actually, you might be interested in knowing that, you know, the bulk of our staff that work in our Southern California facility that regulate cars, they are also car enthusiasts. You should see some of the cars they have. And we've joked about sort of, you know, they probably need vapor control for their garages because these are cars are all before we had canisters or anything. So these are guys that, you know, when they say, hey, we think we can do this and it's not going to affect your performance. And when we were doing our car scrapping regulations and all of those other kinds of programs that affect old cars, those are the guys we're asking. Well, you know, is this, how is this going? It's not gonna meet everybody's needs, I totally get that. That's part of the challenge of the regulatory process. It really is, it's balancing the, the good, the risks and the benefits.
Thanks. Um, I have a more philosophical question. So the, the, um, all of you brought up in some way or another the idea of the scale of behavior or the locus of, of activity or regulation changing. Um, one, of my, one of the concerns that I have uh, about that is that if we look at um, uh, climate change and the action that we might take uh, on a global level, if we could take action on a global level, it would be effective. It would be very, very effective, but we can't act. And if you look all the way at the other end of the scale, the individuals can do lots of things. Probably everyone in the room has done something to change their carbon footprint, but it has uh, almost no impact. It's not effective. And so you look at this sort of intermediate scale that you guys have been talking about, like the cities and states and regions that have come forward and have been effective, but it begs the question of leakage and it begs the question of whether or not the norms of what they, uh, how they act actually creates a situation that adds up to a solution because that, that seems to be the big problem. So my favorite example is the city of San Francisco, which this may be apocryphal, but I don't think it is, decided that they would eliminate all carbon dioxide emissions from their electricity system by not selling their Hetch Hetchy power anymore. And you know that's utterly ridiculous on the systems level. So these are systems problems. They're big systems problems. People only own a little bit of it. What is the action, if any, to create the norms and, and uh, standards that would allow these more local solutions to add up to something that actually is a solution? Who would like to start? Naba? OK, I'll start with, oh, with this, this input. I mean, I think, I mean, this is now becoming more like personal opinion, I guess. It's more at the level, um, you know, because it's such a global issue, uh, I, it's, it seems good if there's an international agreement that drives at least, you know, that everybody says we agree to it, whether it's feasible or not, temperature goal, etc. That driving down the top down, driving down, giving the uh, room within which the constraints within which a local or state or other uh, parts of a country can uh, perform, you know, or try to accomplish that would be a mechanism, I feel like, you know, maybe a possibility there. Of course, you yourself said that it, we can't even, with that goal, uh, it's not going to be possible to do. And that part is already unknown to people, and I guess somehow that would have been good for everyone in the world to know. But, uh, you know, beyond that, having higher level uh, agreement, then that defining the constraints, more like a top-down kind of ends up being. Maybe that's what uh, Jonas was saying earlier, but, you know, in terms of, like, how you get to the point where you know your budget, what you have to work with. Maybe you can add <laughs> I, I wonder, uh, your question makes me think about whether we have kind of an equilibrium model for, for governance. Um, and that, you know, if that were true, that you could look at a lot of different policies and instead of hand, wringing our hands and complaining, we could say, well, we're just doing our best. Um, you know, yeah, we, we can't act at the international level with one rule for climate change. And so it then devolves down in this equilibrium pressure to have less effective, but actions that do get taken. Um, and so one question for all of us is, do, is that the model that we have, the overriding model that we have um, in thinking about this uh, range of governance scales? And if so, then the question becomes, um, how do we decide when we want to move it one way or the other, and how do we do so? Um, which gets back to your question about modifying cars. You know, If you're unhappy with that, um, if, if the equilibrium model is right, then for you to ask for more flexibility, um, then there's a cost. It, it means that something's gonna happen on the other end. And are we willing to bear that cost? Are we excited for that? How do we make a decision about moving that? Or do we have a model that's, that's a kind of a win-win a that we can always find a great solution that's gonna work at multiple scales for everybody um, and we just have to be more creative? So, and I would just offer sort of from the practical perspective, in California, I think we thought a fair amount about the leakage problem with climate change. And um, I think there's sort of two practical things that the way that I, that I think about it. One is that we have to actually account for the whole system, for leakage in the system. And so that's something that um, the way actually the statute is written, the way the legislature gave it to it says, hey, you have to consider leakage. I think they were probably more concerned about economic leakage than emissions leakage, but I think that they are, you know, that they they are synonymous in many ways. And I think it is true that if all we're doing is reducing emissions in California, 
and those same products are getting, you know, the oil, ref the oil isn't being refined here, it's being refined somewhere else, in, or it's being refined in India and they're shipping it here, is that better for the climate? Probably not. Um, so we're explicitly required to consider leakage on our regulations for climate change. I think the other piece of it that's really important and has been a co cornerstone of our program is really um, not just taking these actions, but taking leadership to try to convince other people to take the actions. California is less than 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. We could turn off California and it would make zero difference. But the difference that we can make is that we can implement programs that actually work. We can talk with people about this. We can work with other jurisdictions, other countries, you know, to, to spread those ideas and try to build you know, and maybe that's a little bit sort of Pollyanna and optimistic and pie in the sky, but it goes back to you have to do something about it. And so we can, you know, we can um, uh, pioneer and pilot these things in California and say, hey, this could work, you know, in a, in a federal government that was functional and, you know, you actually could get something done. Here's a, here's a system that we've, we've worked on here and you could take this and, you know, with modifications, you could do this for the country. And I think that your question raises a really interesting, the fact that we do have fragmented governance in the face of a transboundary problem raises an interesting question about strategic interactions, what you alluded to earlier. Um, do these early moves of regulatory leaders have unintended consequences, or consequences that facilitate regulatory co cooperation at a later stage? California's early investments in renewable energy, this, uh, the zero emission vehicle standards, they all helped to channel investments into these technologies and make them cheaper. Now, other countries, India is very interested in so rolling out solar industry uh, and uh, installing solar panels um, without actually having the regulatory um, policy in place because the unintended consequence was making the technology much cheaper. So you have these kind of ripple effects um, that could then potentially lead to greater regulatory cooperation. So, Jane, the other Jane. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm Jane Flagel. I'm a PhD candidate in ESPM here. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about um, uncertainty and controversial science in these terrains. So it seems to me that there is a problem in some of these politically contentious regulatory or scientific spaces where you have both um, uncertainty and a lack of clarity from both the scientific community and policy ma uh, makers about what constitutes sufficient evidence to act in some of these spaces. And then you have often economic actors who use these contested terrains of science to promote their own interests at the expense of others. And given that that has been a noted dynamic in these sort of contentious science policy spaces, I'm wondering what the layering of either complex or fragmented or multi-scalar or cross-sectoral governance approaches might do to that dynamic. Does it make it worse or does it potentially make it better? And I'm just curious if you have intuitions or thoughts about, about that question. I, I want to add just um, from GAO, the perspective of, uh, I was mentioning the climate change you know, mitigation. It was hard to just point to you know, the climate change and you have to do something, but we want to raise attention to that. So you have to find a way to, that's like a, um, understood by people who are giving money, you know, which is that, oh, you might cost more money here, more money there, there may be fiscal problems because of having to deal with climate change. So therefore, and then that gives the in for us to look at those programs and comment on them and that might eventually. So I'm just saying, you know, sometimes if it's with controversial science, especially for organizations, I mean, if government agencies or us as agency of Congress, we cannot necessarily question those very easily because you know, it's a controversial matter to begin with. So we have to find a way around to take action, basically. So. Others? Response to this issue I, of contentious science? I, I think science? Your, um, your question brings us back to the question of mi mission-driven science, too, um, because I think that you can think about those situations when there's political and scientific controversy as an opportunity for stakeholders or decision makers to, to make a decision that we need to investigate certain questions. Um, and th this is the area of uncertainty that needs to be reduced and prioritizing that over other areas. <laughs> 
I think to, I want to also mention two other points, which is uh, there's always in Congress the thinking of, uh, you know, regulation will kill innovation, things like that. That tension is always there. Uh, not that this solves anything, but just to know the principles in mind. And then, of course, the second one is that they're always thinking that uh, whatever is proposed should not benefit one technology versus another, because there are many stakeholders, right? So some technology agnostic way, if it can be stated what's needed and it's kind of somewhat clear cut, everybody agrees, then there's more action, easily action taken by Congress. Anyone else on that? No, okay. Yes, uh, in the back there. Hi, my name is Declan Cush. I'm also from Australia, and um, I had a specific question for Jonas um, on emissions trading. I, I think it's a really interesting example to think through how loci of, of regulation are set and by whom. So in this case, it's obviously been economists who've made their careers out of establishing emissions trading as the kind of obligatory point of passage through which regulation of climate change has to pass. And I'm just interested in your perspective. We've we've had a uh, many years of experience with with emissions tradings now, and not much to show for it around the world. In Australia, we had what was arguably one of the best design schemes that was just abolished um, because of its political unacceptability, essentially. And we've seen a similar pattern around the world. So I'm just wondering, um, at what point uh, do we start to look at the, um, what you've described as the kind of testing of different methods and uh, decide that there are other approaches that um, might be more actually effective in this case. Um, for example, uh, the development of, of clean energy uh, incentives around the world, such as renewable energy targets in, in Australia, have been far more effective, uh, on, at least on their own terms, even if not in a kind of technical sense of uh, trying to reduce emissions against some fictional counterfactual. Thanks. Um, thanks for the question. That's a very interesting one. Um, so I think it raises a bigger issue about um, preferential access of some scientific knowledge than others. So yeah, you're right. It was very much driven by a small group of economists that shaped the thinking about what is the right response um, to, to climate change. And the reality actually is that complementary measures, all kinds of support policies for renewable energy, and energy efficiency measures are much more widespread than carbon pricing. And recent analysis in Nature Climate Change showed that the emissions reduction we have seen are to a large extent attributable to these complementary policies. And here we slowly have this process where um, the ideal policy solution that has been on the minds of policymakers and many advisors is increasingly questioned. Um, but we still have this paradox of carbon pricing diffusing, a certain regulatory choice becoming very prevalent. I mean, China is moving towards a national market, but the actual um, emission reductions being very limited. Um, so, I mean, I view it mostly as a backstop measure. It doesn't give us additional emission reductions, just to make sure we don't slide back. Um, but uh, I think there are interesting questions about what kind of knowledge um, gets entrenched in the regulatory process, which one doesn't. Anyone else like to? Uh, I feel like I have to say something. Jump into we that. Run a crop and trade <laughs> program, um, I, and, and I, I would agree, though. I think that you know, complementary. We call them in California complementary measures, and so we do have a cap and trade program, but we also have a very, very large suite of other programs that also address the climate change problem. And um, so they are you know, energy efficiency, renewable portfolios, energy efficiency requirements, um, renewable portfolio standard. We have CO2 emission standards for cars. We have a low carbon fuel standard. We regulate refrigerants. We were, you know, we, we're a regulatory agency. We've got regs for pretty much everything. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the, the carbon price is an important element of our program. And um, I think it also, what it does, is it does provide this absolute cap on what your emissions are going to be. Um, in, our, in our program for reaching the 2020 goal, um, these complementary measures get us most of the emission reductions. So, you know, I could point to you to different kinds of things and we could add them up, but there's still a gap that, that we would expect that the cap and trade program is going to reduce some of those emissions. And the other thing that I would say is that, um, and this is anecdotal, but 
the conversations that we have with the companies that are covered by the cap and trade program is they had to make internal changes in how their company looks at their operations to institutionalize the cap and trade program. And I think that to me, that was really, in, in talking with companies, that was the thing that made me say, hey, this thing is actually, it's changing the discussion that's happening in the boardroom. And I think that's what's really important. Um, there are other states that are looking at sort of other carbon schemes, and, and one of the other states was telling me, they said, oh yeah, I was talking to one of the oil companies, and they said, oh, as long as you don't do that cap and trade thing California has, we, that was so much work. We had to change everything we did. And I thought, well, that's exactly what we want you to do. We want you to think about this differently, right? We want you to internalize the cost of carbon in your operations. And so I, I think that there is perhaps anecdotal evidence that you know, companies are actually reacting. Um, and you know, we are seeing, for, in California, emissions are below the cap, but I think the complementary policies are really key part of that also. Okay. I'd like, you want one la last quick point, and then I'd like to have everybody kind of conclude but go ahead, Jason. Okay. Sorry. Well, this could, even, this could count as my concluding one. <laughs> okay. um, just thinking, I wonder if there's a comparison here between um, you know, the, the rejection of carbon taxes in favor of cap and trade programs and the rejection of golden rice that uh, Jacob was bemoaning. Um, and that may seem like a huge stretch, but th there's something at play here about you know, the best expertise, um, at least a certain kind of expertise, recommends a certain solution which is golden rice in one example, and a carbon tax, which is more efficient in everything that I've read, and I haven't read that much, um, a better solution to putting a price on carbon. And yet that gets rejected by the politics out there, and so we get other kinds of solutions. Um, and so what do we, what do, we do with that? Um, do, you know, do we just complain and uh, cry because our expertise isn't getting implemented, or is there, is there a way to work with those difficult situations um, and somehow integrate the politics that are out there into the kind of research that we do so that we do a little bit better than, um, than we are now? Okay, I'd like to give you each one minute to kind of conclude and um, uh, tell, us, tell us what you're thinking at the end of the panel. What, what important message do you want to leave the uh, uh, audience with and uh, basically just to wrap up. So give you each a minute. Can you do it? Yeah, sure. you want to start, Eden? So um, I, I, this has been actually really, really interesting. And as I said, the whole day has been interesting. I'm looking forward to talking to folks um, on other topics. I think the question that really intrigued me from the first panel, which I, I'm going to repeat here and I hope we can talk about later, is how can we make the dialogue between the science community and the regulators a more sophisticated dialogue? Because clearly there's an interaction and I think that that's something that in California we've tried to do that. Actually, we worked with Jane on trying to do that. And I think that that's a really interesting area. And I think it goes to you know the question that you just posed um, about you know how do we how do we get that fuller dialogue so that we are more informed and that um, the science community is more informed about where we think we're heading. Jason, you get an extra minute. Oh, I got an extra minute. Oh, it didn't count. How oh, nice. Um, <laughs> I guess I, I'm, I'm interested in, I mean, because I'm a researcher, I'm thinking about the question of what organizational forms do we have to address these difficulties in governance and how do we study them? Um, you know, it's, it, it's not enough just to describe them um, with, you know, two by twos or even big lists of characteristics, um, but how do we study them in a way that makes them better? So I, I would add that, of course, the uh, locus of regulation for all these problems depend on the domain, the, the problem areas, and which is why we only pick three examples and talk about it. And it differs all, it, it's all over the place, but cases where uh, the scientific knowledge is lacking to support something, or data, nowadays, I mean, the big data thing comes up a lot too, because people are collecting more data. The more there's data or scientific results to show, to support um, need, where, where truly there is a need for regulation, uh, would be important, and uh, that has to come from outside. I mean, generally, the agencies are not probably prepared to have that much knowledge in-house. You know, they have to consult e experts outside and to get the knowledge in. And of course, some areas might require public participation-oriented work also. And, and finally, I'll leave with those two things that you know it's very important to make sure that uh, you know they understand that 
the um, uh, balance between regulation and innovation is always going to be present when there are many, many stakeholders, like Congress, when they consider it. And of course, the technology agnostic way to think about it. I mean, you know, if it's possible to characterize some, that's why then maybe a temperature goal is good because it's like saying one number and that's the one thing. You're not saying how to do it. And then it gradually devolves to defining the, how the steps are taken to accomplish that at a better, different level. So th those are the kind of things I leave you with. Thanks. Jonas? Um, I'm coming away from this panel with a question on the location of policy making for the benefits and the risks of um, emerging technologies. The benefits, risks was a constant theme, but to me, the, the policy making happens a bit in different spaces. These are emerging technologies that are growth opportunities. We have innovation policies, Department of Energy, Department of Defense investing them, but they're also risky, and that happens in, in other fora. How do they relate to each other and uh, empirically, and how well should they be integrated? Um, how much should funders be concerned about the risks? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned very early on that there was in the nanoscale a technology was a, a development um, act early on, but then risk assessment came later. How do these two sides relate to each other? Okay, I want to thank the panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much, and uh, give you some important information. We have lunch coming up uh, for those who are uh, whose bellies are are growling. Uh, it's going to be in this um, this room to the to the left here, yeah, to my left. And uh, um, but um, get your food and come back out here because we're going to have a, a rousing speech uh, by <laughs> by Ed Penhote at uh, a little before one. And the title of his uh, talk, which I had here in front of me, is um, going to answer some of these questions or address some of these questions. Uh, <laughs> Uh, raise the expectations for you, Ed. Uh, the title of the talk is Perspectives on Regulatory Science from Three Lives. So you get to hear uh, the three lives of Ed Penhote, I guess. So um, enjoy lunch. Don't leave. Come back and listen to Ed uh, um, um, make a, a nice luncheon speech. And uh, thank you very much to the panelists. Great job. And thanks to the audience for questions. Thank you. Thank you.